radical, like you said, used to mean politics. Yeah. It used to mean socialists. It used to mean fighting back against the status quo and an establishment. And they've corrupted the word. Like, they corrupt everything, yes. I think, you know. Even if you think of the word resistance, which to me is a beautiful word, yeah. now is kind of, now it's like if you use a hashtag, you're like a part of a resistance. And I think with any of these conversations, what's missing is compassion. Obviously, anyone can have compassion for somebody delightful. The test is to have it for someone who's not, who's, right. who's in pain and who's causing pain to others. Yeah. And until we do that, and we've seen it with a lot of the cases of young people running away to join Daesh or to go to Syria, um, they're just condemned and, and pushed out. They're rendered stateless, their passports are taken away, and we dehumanize them. There was a, there was a well, it was the New York Times International Edition, it was the front page. And the headline was something grotesque. It was, it was about these women and children who had belonged to Daesh and now were left in the camps. And it said, is an ISIS child a child or a time bomb? Ooh. And I remember looking at this and thinking, how can a child be a bomb? You know, how, what, what level of dehumanizing do you have to have for a group of people to mm. imagine that a child is a bomb? Right. And, and so the compassion is missing entirely. It's just, it's nowhere present. I think you're right. And, and I think it's almost too generous to say that that child was dehumanized. I yes. would argue yes. <laughs> that they, we began from a place, a kind of a priori position of they're not human anyway. Yeah. By virtue of living in South Asia, by virtue of living yeah. in Syria or Lebanon yeah. or Jordan or Palestine or Egypt or wherever, you're not human. Yeah. So with that kind of vision, it's easy to normalize the violence that happens. It's easy to normalize yeah. the oppression that we see. And the same thing happens here in the United States. And I get at that a little bit with this idea of nobodiness. Yeah. We've rendered people who are addicted to certain drugs sure. as, as not worthy of investment or love. You know, if you're an alcoholic or you smoke too many cigarettes, oh, you, gotta, you make a bad health choice. Yeah. Crack, yeah. you're a bad person. Yeah. You know, so you can romanticize in a certain sense, even in movies, you know, the cocaine addicted lawyer who just works hard and parties harder, the frat boy who, right. you know, you can understand that. But if somebody says they do crack, you're Canceled. making, yes, you're making ethical, moral judgments about them. You're dehumanizing them. Yes. You're, you're, they're not making bad choices. They're bad people and bad people go to jail. Yeah. So we can erase them. We have to find a way to have compassion for everybody, yeah. but to rehumanize or, or recalibrate our imagination to recognize the humanity Absolutely. of the people who, who are catching the most hell. Do you think uh, we are living in a world now that's characterized by a politics of identity at both state and society levels? We've always had a world of identity. Um, I think the question is more which identity? Hmm. Which identities are central to us? Which identities govern how we engage? And which identities, all of which are socially constructed, have become so normal hmm. that we can't think outside of them? You know, the, the state, you asked whether it's an individual or state level, I would argue, lastly, hmm. um, <laughs> that the, at the state, I mean, the very idea of the state is a political imaginary. It's, a, it's, it's something that's new. We didn't have states 200 years ago. We didn't have nations. We had empires. We've had other things. And those distinctions themselves are arbitrary. And they're not real, but, they, but they're formed and they demand a certain kind of violence, a certain kind of exclusivity. They demand ethnic minorities. They demand all kinds of stuff that creates more messiness. Yeah. So for me, I'm not trying to live with a, in a world without identity. I just want to be more thoughtful about how we think about identity yeah. and, and ask ourselves questions that we haven't thought about before. Maybe the, our identities around manhood and masculinity are so destructive that they're killing us. Yeah. This idea of being straight or gay, maybe that's what's killing us. Yeah. Maybe this idea of being part of the nation you got people in arbitrary borders that were, that were designed by colonial, you know, clerksmen with, with, a, with a straight ruler. Suddenly, you're in Iran and you're right. You know, and suddenly, we're at war because we're, we have sectarian differences. Yeah. When 50, 50 years before, we was the same place, we were the same village. Yeah. I'm saying let's reimagine these identities. Yeah. Mark, you, you spoke about the um, oppression of the underprivileged. Passionately, and, and indeed, you spoke about pushing the boulder. Considering how corrupt the American system is, how all the politicians are in the most of them are in the pockets of business. Yeah. Um, and all my friends, in, in, uh, American friends, talk about the gridlock of politics in America. How can you break 
the gridlock? It's a good question. Um, I believe that organized people defeat organized power. And the only way to break the gridlock is to take uh, the most marginal folk in this system, the people who have been muted the most by the political system and erased, marginalized, and bring them into the system, expand the base, and demand new political solutions from the mainline political class. It can't happen with the current system. It can't. It can't. Um, but we can't even demand new possibilities if we don't have the numbers on the ground. Um, in 1984, Jesse Jackson ran for president. He did not win. You probably know that. You, you, you'd know if he had. Um, he ran again in 1988. And in both cases, he was very successful. He, he won 13 states in 1988. It's a lot of states. Most people don't even know how many he won. But the way he got his, his base, he expanded the base. He went to people who had never been registered before, people who didn't know how to read, people who were working in chicken factories in South Carolina, and he organized them and he registered them to be a part of the process. And yeah, he lost in 88, but... And so there's a way that if we can stimulate the base, expand who ha who's in the conversation, new possibilities can emerge. But I don't romanticize that, hmm. right? We can't vote capitalism out of office. We can't, we can't vote imperialism away. But if we have a wider number of engaged citizens, we can develop strategies, tactics, and solutions that can get us to new places and new possibilities.